Welcome to the Popcorn Talk Network. For the online broadcast network that features movie discussion, news, and interviews, press one. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. In a world where action movies are constantly exploding at the box office, our heroes take on the monumental task of dissecting and analyzing all aspects of action movies to truly understand what it takes to make a great action film. Ben Bateman, Andrew Guy, in a Popcorn Talk Network exclusive, this is Action Movie Anatomy. Boom, what's up guys? How's it going? Welcome to Action Movie Anatomy on Popcorn Talk, the online movie network dedicated to talking movies and all things movie related. I'm Ben Bateman, your host, joined today by my trusted co-host, Andrew Guy. What's up everybody? Glad to be here. You will be taken by the end of this episode. <laughs> you, will, you will be taken. Uh, and we have a very special guest today. Hello, it's, it's Kathy, Kathy Kelly. Kelly. Um, that was, I would say, a six out of ten on Liam Neeson. I got, I got to yeah. warm up. We can yeah. yeah. warm into our impressions. <laughs> by the end of the episode, it's gonna be perfect. But I he, think you actually have to get more cold to get into more, character. More yeah. Deadly. By yeah. the end of the episode, all of our impressions will just sound like Tom Cruise. Yeah. That's what usually <laughs> happens. That's like Either that or Vincent D'Onofrio. <laughs> yes, that's the mo of the show. Uh, so, guys, this is action movie. Anatomy. We talk action movies on this show. We talk action movies made 1981 or later that apply four basic rules. No, number one, the hero always plays by their own rules. Rule number two, the hero and the villain are always the smartest people or dinosaurs or aliens are sometimes in the room. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. Rule number three, the movie is driven by a police, military, or political figure. And rule number four, the movie contains a minimum of one explosion. I think it should be like a minimum of ten. Because yeah, I feel like... one is like, that's in like rom-coms, there's one. Yeah, that's like, have you driven a car in your life? That's yeah. like what that feels ten, like. There weren't ten in this movie. That's I feel right, like too. there's like ten explosions in this movie. If you really thought hard, are there not? No. I don't think there's ten. In that one scene where just like the, Maybe the like head exploding moments, Construction yard. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not those actual count, explosions. Those <laughs> we could say metaphorical explosions. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, uh, this is Taken, the Liam Neeson action nuts and bolts old school movie made in 19... and 2008. 2008. Feels like a, 19, <laughs> made in 1904. It, it, it feels like one of those movies from like 1988, but that yeah. was like made in 2008. Yeah, it feels like a, a mid 80s, like mid 90s. Yeah, yeah, which is rare that they're so successful. But this movie was very successful. So we are going to show the trailer right now for you guys and we'll kind of chatter over it. Um, I don't know who you are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember like when the trailer for this movie came out and like I almost feel and I still actually feel that the trailer is better than the movie. Really? Yeah, yeah it's because basically the movie is that the speech. Trailer. Yeah, it's the speech that he gives. That's like the whole movie. It's to me. so iconic though. Like that's something that I feel like people who have seen the movie once are still quoting that line. Absolutely. It's, it is. it's literally the equivalent of the speech that Bill Pullman gives in Independence Day, which we talked about last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's is, it's just the one thing about the movie everyone knows. Right. Even if you've seen it, whether you haven't or not, it, it's like, it is the best part of the movie. Ingrained in your memory. Yes. And it's even, life. it's even funnier too because in the trailer, there's like that really like melancholy piano music that plays behind it. And when I think about that scene in the movie, in my mind, that's what's happening, but it's actually not in the movie, it's just in the trailer. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hate that. Do you? Somebody, no, I just hate that there's those moments in trailers where you're like, this is so awesome. And yeah. then it happens in the movie, it's like, it's like they go like right past it. Yeah. It's yeah, not yeah. dramatic at all. The power of editing. Yeah, that's right. Right. Well, and even like we were talking, we were watching the movie. We we're like, I wish he gave the speech just a little slower. A little slower. Totally. <laughs> what? Just a hair slower. Yeah, just like it's a little. So it'd be slower. a little more dramatic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, extreme. First, dramatic. like three quarters of it could be a little slower. I mean, you see the whole movie in this trailer. Yeah, absolutely. Like every bit of it. <laughs> in fact, all the parts Except the of the last 10 minutes, <laughs> but like all the parts of the movie that are like not that exciting are the parts that you just don't see in the trailer, right? Yeah. Everything relevant mm -hmm. is shown in the trailer. Um, but anyway, you don't get to see the pop concert in the trailer. That's my favorite. Oh yeah, part. that's true. <laughs> with Shira. Yeah. With Shira. What pop star do we think Shira is supposed to like be? Is that like supposed to be? She's kind of a bitch. Mm. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, is she supposed I to... I think a lot of them are. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. To be at that level of success. Is she know? just supposed to... Where to people be... are trying to shank you in the alley behind your concert. The like the conveniently placed... Yeah, uh... just kind of like standing there with a knife. Yeah, right. Why do you have a gun? I don't right? know, because he's crazy, man. Well, yeah. He clearly. <laughs> he didn't think this operation through. Maybe he didn't actually want to kill her. Maybe he just wanted to, like, slice her up. Or maybe like, he, wanted to, he, he wanted to take her. Maybe. Yep. Or maybe, like, Liam actually hired the guy. Yeah, like, in, like, I'm still relevant. <laughs> like in Kingpin. That was, <laughs> was D'Onofrio. <laughs> yeah, that was D'Onofrio. You were going to the D'Onofrio voice. 
Uh, did you um, did you watch Daredevil, the Netflix series? Um, I watched the first maybe five episodes, yeah. and then I just had other series that I felt took precedence. So, so you are familiar with like with the D'Onofrio Vanessa with Kingpin's voice. voice. Yep. Okay, good. good. You gotta stay away. <laughs> from we do that a lot one. of that one, yeah. We should probably do the Bane voice more often on this show. Uh, we should. Yeah, we don't do a lot of the Bane. All right, so guys, that's the trailer for Taken. I don't agree with you. I don't think that the, the trailer's better than the movie. Okay, it's at least as good, but that's just it's it's one man's opinion. <laughs> it's one man's opinion. It's one man's opinion. So, uh, and yours is wrong. Okay. <laughs> just joking. Fair enough. Right. Let's get into uh, bold statements and fist pump moments. Yeah. So do you guys have your thesis statements prepared? You go first. I'm going first? Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, Oh, you know what? I'm going to stop you for a second and remind the audience just because it's episode. Sometimes we get new viewers. I don't know. But they I, might know what we're doing here. So, guys. I, hey, it's okay. This is our bold statement moment in the show. And what we do here is we come up with one idea that sort of is the underlying theme for our opinion of the movie. Uh, it shouldn't be like, I feel this way. It should be, it is this way. And uh, basically, if you have your own, you should share it with us in the comments, as you guys so often do. So, please comment and let us know what you think. You can follow me on Twitter if you want to tweet at me about this. I am Ben Baton Media. Uh, at Andrew Guy on Twitter, G H A I. At Catherine Kelly. So, just in case you guys want to share your ideas with us, that's where to share them. So, let's get straight into it. Andrew, bold statement. What do you got? All right. So, this is like, for this movie, this is like a, a Matt Damon Goodwill Hunting equation right here for action movies. Oh, wow. This movie is the perfect action movie equation. They figured out how to do it just right. All of it. Just enough action. You care about the characters just enough. There's not a lot of bullshit in it. Sure. You no, know, they cut they they cut to action to scene to scene. That's all yeah. very quick. Yeah. Um, they figured it out, and by the reception critically and with the box office, it's it's pretty evident that somehow this movie that no one thought was going to be good, Liam Neeson doing an action movie, even he didn't think it was going to be yeah. good. He was like, whatever, I'll go travel in Paris and France. So I'll have shocked. fun. Yeah. And yeah, and maybe I can like reinvent myself as an action movie star at age fifty four. At right? age fifty four, so awesome. maybe <laughs> somehow Luc Besson. Wrote Luke, this, Luke Besson. Luke Besson. Yeah, you got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> wrote this perfect action movie equation. Whatever it is, I don't, I don't know, but they figured it out. Yeah, he was like, let's look at everything that like, uh, let's look at everything that Stallone and De Niro did, and, right. and Schwarzenegger in the '80s, and just take that. And yeah, then, I mean, this is a mid '90s, like we said in the beginning. This is like a mid '90s or uh, late '80s action movie that came out 20 years later. Yeah, and it worked. Or 10 years, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the only ones. Yeah. I like that. What do you got? Thank you. This is a movie that is so absolutely ridiculous on paper, but makes so much sense on the screen. Like when you're yeah. watching it, you're so invested in it. And if you actually were to write down some of the quotes or the things that happened, it's so... Oh yeah. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, you just have what moments? Like, oh yeah, the second room that he walks into, he sees his daughter's jacket. The, right, there are right. just so <laughs> many like happenstance moments. Oh, the, the second girl that comes out, like he happens to walk into uh, the auction and she's the second girl that comes out. Like, right, it's perfect. There are so many moments that are perfect timing that would never happen in real life, but you're so invested in these characters by the end of the movie that yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely true. It's so true. I went through and I was like trying to figure out my favorite quote, and I was like, oh, the speech, right? But then I went and looked at all like all these other quotes from the movie. Yeah. I was like, oh my god, they're all so bad. They're it's kind so of good. like a Mad Libs at one point. I feel like I wrote down some other quotes, but it's just a fill in the blank. Oh, of... totally. I'm like, what word should we put here? There was like, <laughs> we're like some of the we're like we were watching it. You're like, God, that's so bad. What do you like? Yeah. Like some of those lines. Like so, you're gonna, I'm gonna. Like... Oh yeah, no, I got, I got that one right here. It's, uh, it's the. Um... No, here, here, you give yours and I'm going to pull up the line. I wrote okay, it down okay, like okay. a minute ago. What girl would say, uh, Amanda's character, uh, what girl would say, oh yeah, and we're home alone. We have the place to ourselves. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah oh yeah, like right in front of this random guy that you never met that some reason got out of the cab yeah. that he took with you. Or yeah. after all of this, um, Kim going through things that I can't even imagine being happy and cheerful a couple days later going oh, yeah. to meet She's... a pop star like nothing no no ptsd well yeah. the best the best part about that is when they get back to the airport like they're like oh yeah my friend's dead but i'm happy to see my family <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They don't ever acknowledge her. where's your friend uh she's dead in europe but i'm safe this is great or Liam Can I ride Mason my pony? saying um i really want to take you to the airport that's my only stipulation for you being able to go on the trip but then the mom is also there so why did he even take her to the airport right fomke jansen's a bitch yeah, that's why she's I, so horrible in this movie. What? She's evil. Don't let Marissa. No, know she that. no, that's no. I don't think that she's bad in the actress. movie. I think that she's evil in the movie. She's like an evil. She's person. like a very yeah oblivious mother. So then, what happens to her in Taken Two? Right, we'll find she's out. Nice you'll have to. Right, you'll right, have to. So it's Taken Two. <laughs> you either give me what I want, 
<laughs> I can't even say. What either, is the other? Either give me what I need, or the switch will stay on until they turn off power for lack of payment on the bill. <laughs> That's a good one. I love that one. Um, what is the other Liam Neeson movie that he's in um, with January Jones? Oh yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. very uh, similar. It's the uh, imposter. No, it's like where he loses his. She loses. She loses her memory. It's not nonstop. It's called. Um, Run all night. Is Run all day. No, no it was like one? it was like the next year. It was like two thousand nine or something like that. Uh, I saw it on an airplane. Spot like that. Yeah. It's called like uh, replaced or like. Anyway, I'm gonna give my you guys. Yeah, you look give yours. I'll look it up. All right. So this movie, this movie is the most basic acting exercise actualized in a film, and I say that because every acting class I ever took when I was younger, I, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts for a year, like. All of the things in acting, like basic, basic stuff, it's make a choice exactly. and have an objective. Right. That's the whole thing. The stronger choice you make, the stronger objective you have in a scene, if you're even in a class, is un oh, unknown is the name of the movie. Oh, no. yeah. Our, our wonderful producer. I think no. I saw that on the yeah. airplane as yeah. well. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so every choice that you make, they're like, the stronger the choice, the stronger the objective, the better your performance is going to be. So they're like, okay. I got an idea. Let's take a great Oscar-worthy actor, mm -hmm. let's put him in essentially a straight-to-video action movie, and let's give him one objective the entire movie. All he has to care about is getting his daughter back. Mm -hmm. Everything else that he does, it doesn't matter what he's saying, it doesn't matter the dialogue, <laughs> he doesn't even have to read the script. Every scene just be like, Liam Neeson, if you don't get your daughter back, she's gonna die. That's what you have to do in this movie. Right. And that's the whole movie. So it's the ultimate action exercise actualized in a film. That was, that was what I, when I thought about it, that was what I came up with. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get it. Yeah. It's just incredibly basic, the whole thing. Yeah. So it's just like objective and uh, task or yeah. tactic, tactic. And it never changes. Nope. It's, it's not like, it's not like oh, you're the head of the League of Shadows and you have to train Bruce Wayne, but you're actually Ra's al Ghul. Right. It's not like you, you're like, oh, you know, you're like the father no, there's nothing. of there's a nothing, nobleman. There's no layers And it's to the this Crusades. Movie. It's mm -hmm. like, nope, you're just a guy, you're Brian Mills, and yeah. you have to get your daughter back. That's this isn't it. an onion. Yeah. There's no layers. There's no layers. <laughs> it's no complexity. So, uh, yeah. Ducard. I am Ducat. Yeah. All right, so let's get into star profiles. Uh, unless you guys had any other awesome Liam Neeson quotes you wanted to share, we can oh, say no, we'll get there. All of them. Okay. We'll we'll like the recite? whole movie. Yeah. Yeah. Lack of payment on the bill. That's a Lack good line. Lack of payment on the bill. What about uh, our fist pump, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, just, I should have bolded it. Yeah, you guys want to go fist pump? Should we do it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. What do you got? I'm not going first though. I went first oh. last time. Um, my fist pump moment is actually a quote. It is, is it? the the iconic quote is the. the uh, what I do have are a very particular set yeah. of skills, yeah. skills I have acquired over a very long career, skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. I will look for you, I will find you, and I will, I will kill, kill you. you. And I will Damn. kill you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's pretty amazing. I mean, like, in terms of like what people will remember this movie for, you know, twenty years from now, mm -hmm. if you're if you're if you saw this movie once in theaters and you have kids and they're like, What and you're like, Oh, this movie taken, I saw this when I was a kid and he's got this great speech, that's yeah. all you're gonna remember. Mm -hmm. So it, it totally does stand out. I agree with you. My fist bump moment's actually um and this is like a little like screwed up to say, I feel like, but I just remember thinking this in theaters because it's so like weird in an action movie. It's when he's uh, interrogating the French police officer and he shoots his wife in the arm. Oh, it's great. That's such a ridiculous moment though because you're supposed to be this good guy and you're shooting a civilian that's being really nice to you. Yeah, but his thing is like, and this is why I think it's so interesting. And I be, love that part. You'd be much more likely to see it in the movie now, but at the time it was shocking because it was like, if, yeah, he is yeah. this good guy. He is this good guy, but he wants his daughter back so much he doesn't Stop care. Stop nothing. Right. He's like, collateral damage non -stop. doesn't matter to me. Like yeah. he's, yeah, he, yeah, exactly, non <laughs> Up, right, like he doesn't, uh, he doesn't care, and he j and he just shoots her. Now, in my memory, I remember him shooting her in the stomach, which is way more nefarious. Oh yeah, because she's <laughs> pregnant, so that would be horrible. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that didn't happen actually, yeah. but uh, he says it's just a flesh wound too. Yeah. But it looks like it went through. Right. So that was because it's an intense moment. Like I, it's it's one of those. Anytime you have that, like kind of startled, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a fist pump a little bit. Yeah, I love uh, what he says about how it's like the last thing that she'll see before I orphan her children is the bullet that I put between her eyes. It's yeah, like, holy, <laughs> holy crap, man. Yeah, he's calm pretty, down. Just calm down. Pretty awesome. Uh, my fist pump moment is when he finds Peter. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, outside the cabin, he gets in and he starts hitting him in the stomach. And he's like, "The next one of these will drive the, your rib into your lungs." <laughs> it's, it's the first time you really see him like go full action mode, go full crazy. Like you see him prevent yeah. earlier because that's what he is. He's a preventer. Yeah. Uh, he, you see him do that in the hallway with, at the rock concert. Yeah, yeah. But this is the first time you're like, oh, "Liam Neeson's a badass." Yeah, and you're the real deal, man. Yeah. Pete's for being like a uh, real life Frogger, just like, yeah. like, <laughs> <"Burger."> Bam. Bam. <laughs> And then he had a game over. Yeah. 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 That's good. Semi Doesn't truck. Get three more lives. Does not Two go well. No. No more <laughs> no, lives. Man. That was a good joke. Do you do improv? Uh, I don't. Yeah, I do. You do. 
Yes, and. Um, yes, and. Oh, my God. I feel like I'm alone on an island over here. You guys are in a scene right We're now. We're having fun over here, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into star profiles, guys. I want to talk about where Liam Neeson was in his career when he made this movie. This is actually one of, like, the most interesting star profiles, because normally... Very. Normally you look at these guys and like, you know, with Schwarzenegger it was funny that he had done two comedies before Terminator 2 or things like that, but like, Liam Neeson, this career turn is one of the most unique. We were talking about this. I can't think of a lot of people that have had career turns that quite as drastic as this. Right. Especially so late in their career. Like the one that came to my mind was Mickey Rourke. Yeah. Uh, because like the wrestler and then Iron Man and all that, like he, he had pretty much fallen off and then he started to come back. And that was almost by, that was almost like not by his own decision. Yeah, that was kind of like, was, he, he was able to get a role because somebody was nice enough to offer right, it to Right, like him. that was the wrestler. It yeah. Was like, and he was perfect in that. Amazing, like, He was cast yeah. perfectly and that's kind of this thing with, with Liam. I, I don't think anybody thought he was perfect. I think it was well, just. Well, no, I was going <laughs> to say is like they put him in Batman Begins and you're like, ah, uh, and then you see it and you're like, okay, wow, he's really good in yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, that movie's not very good. I didn't see Seraphim Falls. Either of you guys? No, because I was clearly, because I thought it was the one with Thomas Hayden Church. And it's not at all. <laughs> <laughs> you just really like Thomas Hayden Church. I do, yeah. <laughs> Well, I just like Sideways. That movie's great. Oh, it's one of the best. If we could do Sideways on this show, we can't. It's not yeah. an action. No, we can't. There's a scene well, there where... there is some action in it. That guy runs naked through the street. That's pretty action We could do Boogie Nights then in that sense. Because there's one action scene. If there's any, like... Two. If, like, we could get enough votes from our fans that were like, just do Boogie Nights... Oh, we would do I it would a just, heartbeat. Just, I would just skip the parameters for one episode. Because it's, like, my favorite movie Look, if almost. we get enough votes for us to do Boogie Nights, Ben and I will recreate the <laughs> song that John C. Riley and Mark Wahlberg do. <sighs> We'd have to... If, you, if we could get, like... Seven. at least four. Seven votes. <laughs> <laughs> at least seven you votes. Us seven votes, we'll do it. <laughs> six votes. Six okay, votes. Okay, guys. One. One. We just... <laughs> yeah, one. We need six four. That's it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he, he... So, Kingdom of Heaven, 04. Batman Begins, 05. Five and Seraphim Falls. Seraphim Falls is like I think it's like some revenge-driven western with him and Pierce yeah. Brosnan. Uh, yeah. So I remember when the trailer for this movie came out, and we live sort of in an era now where this is very common. But in 2008, this was a newer thing. You guys know when you, you load up Facebook, you see your newsfeed, and there'll be like some link that three people have shared, mm -hmm. and it'll be like Gawker.com has written like the new trailer for Liam Neeson's ridiculous action movie is out and his monologue is awesome. Right. Right. And then somebody comments, you're like, oh, I guess I have to watch this. And you click on it and you're like, oh man, that speech is so sweet. Right. Like I totally remember like just his speech in the trailer kind of went viral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I kept hearing about it from people like, but it was so weird. Yeah, people were saying it before the movie even came out. Yeah. They're right. Like, I will find you and I will kill you. Like, exactly. You because oh, this was the, the resurgence of his career. Yeah, exactly. Because his, but his career was not no it doing wasn't bad, bad but yeah. this was like it's a total recreation well like so we were talking about this because we're going to recast later people who like you think about actors who were in the position at some point in their career in their mid 50s maybe that liam neeson was when he made this right it's very hard. he hadn't fallen off at all he was oscar worthy he had been nominated mm -hmm. for schindler's list by all rights should have won in 93 for schindler's yeah, list. it was amazing absolutely. right he had been in all kinds of great movies over the years like most people would say from a dramatic sense, Liam Neeson was an A-lister in 2008 still. Like, you would still put him in a movie next to any of the top actors in the world and expect he'd hold his own completely. Right, like, he's the A-lister in the sense of, like, uh, he won't be getting all these roles as the lead. Yeah. But if you see him in any great film, yeah. a film that's, like, wild renowned or Oscar-nominated yeah. or whatever, it's like, oh, yeah, he's perfect. In it's it. like yeah. Scorsese he, he casts him as there. DiCaprio's father in some movie. You're like, oh, totally, yeah, he's yeah, going to kill it. I'm into it. So he takes that and like turns it into this. That's like, what would happen if like Richard Gere in the late right. 90s had made Taken right. or like yeah. something? It's like so weird to think about. It does, doesn't make any sense. You know, and it's weird because like action stars in the 90s are so different than action stars now. Um, as, as an audience, we've become so accustomed to like, with, especially with UFC fighting getting so much more popular. Yeah. The stylized martial arts that happens in movies now with like Sherlock Holmes in right. this movie. And it's not the same as in the 90s when you could just give the dude a big gun and he could mow through a room of people. No, yeah. yeah. Which is why like, because Richard Gere did do the Jackal in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it didn't work. You have to have a very particular set of yeah, skills. Yeah, you have to have that <laughs> well, set of skills. Uh, Liam Neeson also had a very particular uh, Stunt double. He's had the same guy for like twelve years prior yeah. to this movie. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of like you get the the package deal. Yeah. <laughs> You've taken both of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah, so I think that's pretty interesting to think in like two thousand eight and then he definitely went on a run. I think he made six or seven movies in this style, right? Yeah. Run all night. Non Walk amongst stop. tombstones, <laughs> non stop unknown, three taken movies. Like that's seven the right there. Movie. It's so oh, crazy. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. It was actually packed, man. I, I love that movie. It's very good. <laughs> yeah, it's just crazy. It, it, it worked. 
It did. It totally what he did. did completely worked. I think I'm a little over it now. Like I wouldn't go see. I still haven't seen Taken Three. Nor did nor did I. Yeah. But it made the most money. Did you? Did it really? Yeah. Yeah. We'll get wow. to that. We'll, yeah. we'll get. To we'll, that. Get, we'll, we'll get. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So let's talk Maggie Grace because uh, her three prior films are. I don't want to say underwhelming, but maybe a little bit less notable than the three that uh, Liam did. What are we you have, talking about? We have The Fog in 2005, starring Tom Welling of the Smallville fame. We have Suburban Girl in 07. She looks so wildly different. She does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Suburban Girl in 07, which was starring like, I don't know, like uh, McDreamy maybe, or like some somebody like that, and uh, someone else. And yeah. then the Jane Austen Book Club in 07, which I remember and hearing. Emily Blunt. And, yeah, yeah, I heard yeah. about it. I never saw it. Did you see the Jane Austen Book Club? No. I heard it was all right. Okay. I, I, so our opinions on those movies <laughs> sound like they're going to be <laughs> yeah I mean that's the thing is that her career was not in a place where she was in movies that are marketable to the, the wide audience that mm-hmm. is like as viewers well you know, she got is... she even got a little typecast after this movie because if you guys recall she was in that movie with Guy Pierce, uh, the Lockout oh yeah the one where the trailer so it's this movie where like ba- there's like some weird thing going on and there's like a, a giant floating prison above the world that is like in space genius and it's the best it's this like the, the baddest criminals and she's like the daughter I think of, of the president or something like that okay and she's working on that prison as like you know I missed that one right. and Guy Pierce. It, well they, they set the trailer up in this hilarious way like we could we, if you play the trailer right now you'd crack up because they go they're like, your daughter's been kidnapped. Dun, dun. It's like, there's only one man who can do it. He's like, and he's like, steal, but he's a loose cannon. And it's like, and it who shows it? it's Guy, Guy Pierce. Pierce. Oh, and he gets actually. jacked for it. It's it like, it's a bad movie. I but, love Guy Pierce. Yeah, he's sweet. But that's, so she's like totally the same thing. She's being saved by a hot shot. It's like the exact same thing. So uh, anyway, Maggie Grace. We have she, a clip. Oh, yeah. Of her talents. Well, she's a talented runner. She's I an think incredibly people. talented runner. She's even acknowledged <laughs> it in some interviews that she's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's acknowledged that she's like a little bit embarrassed about, um, you know, her her <laughs> her talents as a. She just does this thing with her arms. She's like, I don't know why. Like she needs to make a sound when that hand goes up. Oh. It's, I wouldn't doubt. I wouldn't doubt that. Like <laughs> that's, the sound. that's the sound. That's exactly the sound I was looking for. Someone has probably like made a, a funnier video. Oh yeah, with like than music this. and. Oh no no! With this, this is, I think this is the Liam Neeson speech. Yeah, no, we don't we don't want this yet. Although well, I, I mean, we I always want it all want, the yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. I can yeah. always be playing. Here we oh, go. Here we go. Here we go. Maggie yes. Grace running. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so just type this in on YouTube, guys. You'll have a lot of fun. Maggie Grace, I'm sorry. We're not trying to make fun of you. You're very sweet. <laughs> We're not trying to make fun of you, but we are. <laughs> you made fun of yourself. Somebody else made fun of you making this video. Watch the hand. Watch We're the just hand. Showing it. Here we go. Arm. <laughs> 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 My little, yeah. <laughs> my little Kimmy's seventeen. <laughs> oh, this yeah. this one's my favorite. This is the best one. Because she, she gets the turn around. Yeah, but the, hands up in the air, turn around. <laughs> it's like uh, not that pronounced, but it's like I like it's that just I, enough. I like that she acknowledged it in an interview. Yeah, exactly. That she makes, knows it looks ridiculous. Oh, this is this is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> she always like hunches over. I mean, she does play. She does play like an awkward teenager well. Well, it's funny because she's actually older than Amanda, and she plays two years younger than her in the yeah. film. Right. Um, see, that's like a real run. That one's okay. Her arms don't flap as much there. No, they're down. She's left. She's, she's well, just been taken. She was taken. Yeah, she learned a lot. She learned a lot of her experience <laughs> overseas. Um, so that's that. That's so, that. I hope so, you guys enjoyed that half as much as I did. Yes, I'm sure they did. <laughs> so let's talk production development about how this movie got made. Um, so first and foremost, uh, Europa Corp, right? That's uh, mm-hmm. that's Luc Besson's company, founded in 2000. So this is interesting. It's one of the few companies that integrates a studio and distribution company all together. So he wrote this movie, um, developed it, as well as the whole Transporter franchise, right? That's yeah. all this one company. So they, they put out tons and tons and tons of releases. They're not outsourcing. They're not like making the movie and then selling it to a distribution company. They actually do the whole thing themselves. So every dollar that this movie, the whole franchise made, goes to his company. So Luc Besson is doing quite well. Oh, yeah, between wow. those two series, he's doing just fine for himself. Yeah. Especially because the Transporter has two more installments coming to go into number five. Yeah, well, the fourth one's like about to come out. I think or so. Or It might be announced, I'm not sure. And then fifth and sixth are announced. Yeah. So, yeah, that's just churning them out. I mean, it's crazy when you when you think about like, we're okay, so we're watching this movie, right? And we're thinking to ourselves like, yeah, we know exactly what we're getting here. We're getting like an entertaining action movie. We're not expecting them to reinvent the wheel. We're not expecting this movie to be an omnivore for an Oscar. Right. So really, if we can be entertained, they're like, as long as you guys are entertained, the credibility of this franchise, we don't care. Right. As long as it's making money. Mm-hmm. Like, 
now I'm not putting words in their mouth, but I think to some degree that's the that's got to be the mentality when you're pumping out transporters four, five, and six. Mm-hmm. If the action is sound and the movie's making money, they'll just keep making them because people will see them. Yeah, I mean, this is the trailer for this, the marketing for this was kind of like John Wick, right? Where like you're like, this movie's not going to be good. I- I'll probably watch it maybe if I drink enough wine one night or I'm bored enough. Like sure, I'll sure. just sit around and I'll turn it on. Right. But uh, John Wick was awesome. It and this did. movie is also incredible. Yeah. So I think that's another thing they banked on with marketing. It's the same thing with like Terminator Genesis for me. Yeah. It looked like trash. I, was, yep. I wasn't expecting anything out of it. And you go in and you watch it. Like this movie's really damn good. I wonder if they did the trailer in that way so that it would go viral. Because that was, you know. The whole reason. Yeah. Well, social media was just becoming a huge thing at that time when um, companies, film companies, I think, were realizing we don't have to spend as much money on uh, marketing if and advertising if we can do something that people are going to talk about. Right. Yeah. It can just go viral Absolutely. on its own. Certainly. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And and you definitely saw, I mean, in terms of, so this movie came out in 08, right? And, yeah. and, and like, or it was released January of 09, but yeah. Yeah. Like the, the transition that was happening at the time between movies that were actually being promoted with major campaigns and going to theaters and then movies that were going to Redbox and Video On Demand, that separation was just becoming very clear right then, right? Like people were people were like less afraid of it. I mean, whereas in like 2004, for instance, if a movie came out and went straight to video, it was like, there's the straight to video movies, right. and there's the theater and movies. And here, here are real movies, and these don't matter. Yeah, like exactly. I, would, I remember like, you would go to the video store when there were video stores. <sighs> I missed that so much. Yeah, and you would see, a, you know, like the, the box on the wall, and it'd be like, if this movie was starring some A-lister, you'd never heard of it, and it was straight to video, like, oh, well, that must be a bad movie. Exactly. But if you had seen a trailer and it was in theaters, you were like, well, this was probably a decent movie, I just missed it. Whereas I think in 2008, you were just starting to see the transition, and this was one of the big ones where it looked like a straight to video movie, but it had success like a theater movie. Right. And I think nowadays we're in a world where it would be very difficult for a movie to be advertised like this and made like this and be successful in theaters, because it just looks like a straight to video movie. Absolutely. I don't think it would get, I, I just, Something like that. Something like that trailer would have to happen again. I don't think you see it very often. No, right? you don't. Equalizer, John Wick. Like these are movies that come into mind with movies that are like this. Yeah, those were like. I guess they got they got theatrical release, but when they yeah. were in theaters, I was like, I was. I'm not gonna see that. No, I'm not gonna see. I still, you know. I don't necessarily think that it would. It looks like a straight to video movie. I think that it just looks like a movie that wouldn't be as successful as it was. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So Luc Besson got very famous uh, in the mid '90s, uh, most notably with Leon the Professional and The Fifth Element. Those are, I think, I would say classics. I don't think Absolutely, I'm those Element are two of the sure. greatest. I mean, Leon the Professional is one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, and great. I love The Fifth Element. Yeah, they're they're not only like respected; they're cult classics beyond just being classics. Right. If you're our age and you haven't seen one of those two movies, something's yeah. wrong. Yeah, those are great movies. Yeah. And Gary Oldman's just the ultimate badass. Yeah, and he's in both of them being the ultimate badass. <laughs> yeah, he's great. So, uh, yeah, so a few years later, Basan obviously starts the company and then uh, starts cranking these movies out. So it was directed by Pierre Morel, right? Yeah, and he brought him on because he had this demeanor on set that they wanted Liam to have in the movie. Right. He's very lackadaisical, cool-headed, like very calm. Yeah. And he operates cameras himself because he was a cinematographer. Right. And they liked that. They liked that energy on stage that like helped feed off of Liam Neeson. No, he was very cool in the behind the scenes video that I watched. (laughs) So Ben, yesterday, I'm I'm over over at Ben's house. We're doing prep and like I'm sitting there across from him at the table and I'm hearing this interview. You You hear Liam Neeson talk about the film and then you hear like this guy just ranting in French for like five minutes at a time and I'm assuming there's subtitles on I'm interested. I'm like, I'm focused. Yeah, he's like engaged. I'm like, how's that going over there? He's like, it's good. It's good. It's in French, but it's it's good. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So then like five minutes later, he's still watching. I go around and the subtitles are in Spanish, (laughs) which Ben also doesn't read, speak Spanish at all. So basically, for yeah, like, I got a few words. <laughs> Hola. Oh yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Bienvenidos. No. But he was captivating. I mean, probably for the same reason that Basan liked him. You know, I was, I was entertained. You know, you know what's interesting about Basan is that uh, his parents were dive instructors. When oh, he really? was Growing up, so he had like a very cool childhood of like swimming a lot and diving a lot in the ocean. And uh, when he was young. Uh, he had this moment of swimming with dolphin, a dolphin, a very oh. friendly dolphin. And he was like, I'm going to be a marine biologist. That's what I'm going to do with my life. Okay. This is what I want to do. Uh, and when he was 17, he had like this horrible diving accident to where he can never go scuba diving ever again. And oh he goodness. had to completely change his career and exactly what he wanted to do with life. Wow. Like he had no idea. And I'm, it's crazy how the same things always happen for a reason because Fifth Element would have never happened and neither would Leon the professional. And that experience probably 
he's taken it into some of the movies that he's done. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I just think I thought that was cool. I read about that this morning, and I was like, interesting, because we see that about uh, what was the other guy we were talking about like several weeks ago that we, there was a doctor. Cameron? Oh, you're talking about? Oh, you're talking about George Miller? Yeah, George Miller. Mad Max. He, yeah, he was gonna be. He was like a surgeon. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. He's like, ah, I want to make movies. Yeah, and he took that money and he made uh, the wow. first Mad Max. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Crazy. A lot of these guys have crazy. I mean, uh, James Cameron drove a truck. Yeah, he graduated and they drove graduated. a truck before making yep, Terminator. Like, I'm not gonna do this. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So this was so Pierre Morel. He he did. Uh, what was what was the first one he did? Like Assault on B13 Precinct D- District B13, which was like this huge cult success yeah. uh, that introduced uh, parkour style martial arts. That's what it was. Yeah. I remember now. Yeah, yeah. That movie got a lot of press a few years before Taken, mm-hmm. and it was for that reason. Yeah, it was massive. What year was Casino Royale? Uh, 06? 2006, it sounds right, yeah. Right around the same time, and it has that great parkour sequence at the beginning. Yeah, I remember so awesome. parkour was a buzzword, and mm-hmm. I do remember this movie now. Mm-hmm. Uh, parkour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people were really into it, you know? And YouTube was blowing up at the time, so there was all kinds of crazy videos. I'm glad they changed it from freestyle walking to parkour. To extreme walking? <laughs> yeah, just like, that just doesn't sound cool. Should have just called it extreme walking. Yeah. Power walking. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that's, that's its own. It's actually, it's, you just get power walking is its, on its the own ground. breed, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't power walking? Yeah. Like you have the weights. Yeah. Do you, have you guys ever done one of those power walks? The weights. You have to keep one foot on the ground at all times. That's the rule. Is it? Yeah. Or oh. else it's running. Okay. I'm a seasoned power walker. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> um, all right. So, yeah, he makes that. Then he makes Taken in 2008. Uh-huh. Um, did not subsequently make the Taken sequels. Uh, just made this one. Morel. Yeah. Yeah. And he was a cinematographer before he worked on this. So, he's. I guess he, he has, like, you know, he has the visuals. He has the, the vision. And from what I understand, Luc Besson was having a conversation with him over dinner one night where he was basically just like, I want to make this movie where a guy's daughter is kidnapped and... Uh, you know, he has to try to get her back. And Morel was like... It's going to be hard. Morel was like, uh, I love the idea. I want to do this. this, is, this is, <laughs> yeah. And he fell in love with it. And that was that was it. That was the whole thing. Um, as these things often That's happen. That's how Hollywood happens, yeah. It's just so absurd. I know. Well, we found out last week while doing prep for Independence Day right. that the premise for that movie came in like a press interview when like the, when, uh, the director, uh, Roland Emmerich, was like, well, you know, if you, uh, if you were coming to Earth and you were aliens, wouldn't you want to make a huge entrance instead of just like hiding his parasites? And he's like, ding. I have an idea for our next movie. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the movie. Let's go on vacation to Mexico and write it over a month. <laughs> that's yeah. Awesome. yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, but uh, and then he made it from Paris with Love in 2010, as well as The Gunman just this last year with uh, Pen. With Pen, which I didn't actually see, but I heard he was just yoked. Pretty yeah, that's all I heard. Ripped. Yeah, yeah, like veiny, like just jacked out of his mind. Um, but. <laughs> But Paris with Love, which... Uh, with Travolta? Yeah, well, it's relevant for both of us, because we love the taking of Pelham 123 so much, <laughs> which is the other weird Travolta role from, like, the year before, where he's, like, all tatted up and bald. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, did you see Paris with Love? I did, but I was not in the right mind state. Did you see from Paris with Love? <laughs> nor, nor did I. He's, like, got, like, a rocket launcher, I think, and, like, yeah, a sweet overcoat. Yeah, I remember that. Or something. And he's got, the, he's got the goatee again. Mm-hmm. Sweet goatee. Yeah, Travolta. Man, I would love to interview Travolta. That would be so good. That guy's great. Um, yeah, I mean, aside from that on the production development, you know, you have, I, I guess, Besson, like, interviewed Par- like Paris police quite a bit for this right. movie. Uh, you know, he became sort of fascinated with the seedy underworld. This is, like, a real thing, yeah. mm-hmm. this movie. This is, this is, I mean, unfortunately, we joke about this, but, like, the human trafficking angle is not just something that was made up to sell the movie. Right, no, like, they, they, I'm sorry. very... Yeah, a very real concern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually interviewed Dolph Lundgren recently on the uh, for for Skin Trade, this movie that he just came out with with Tony Jaa. I don't like the um, name of that movie. Skin Trade. It just it doesn't sit right with me. Yeah, yeah, it was. It got. I mean, it got. He actually got theatrical. But yeah, it looked like it was. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was another one of these that just like, like we're talking about. Yeah, and that movie is about uh, the same thing. It's about yeah. human trafficking. And I asked him in the interview. There's, you know, there's a lot of movies now that are sort of this is like the, this yeah. is the antagonist. And did you is this something you wanted to write about, or were you kind of jumping on it because it's now like a hot point? And he was like, he got a little annoyed. That I think I suggested that he took the idea from Taken because yeah. I referenced Taken. But he was also like, I'd wanted to write about. It. He was like, I'd wanted to write about this for a long time. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, he's a very smart guy. He is very he's intelligent, great, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and a very family oriented guy too. Yeah, well spoken. Yeah, he yeah. was he was fun to talk to. But uh, he was, you know, he was like, yeah, you know, I came up with this idea a long time ago before Taken. I wanted to write about yeah. this. So this is, yeah, this is this. Yeah, is I mean, idea. this is I mean, a real thing. They talk about like these beautiful mansions just outside of Paris that are just there solely for trafficking human trafficking yeah there was a moment i went to italy when i was really young with my mom and i was walking around i think i was like 12 or 13 with one of my friends who was 14 or 15 at the time and there was a guy that followed us for probably two miles walking and we walked into a store for stayed there for an hour hoping he would leave 
walked out. He was still there, Super followed creepy. us to his hotel, like because we spoke English. And wow. I mean, I know that that's not even the slightest comparison to what yeah. happens. It's close, happens, though. But you know, who knows what would happen? Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. Terrifying. Absolutely. Uh, one thing I liked about Morel's direction in this, and they talk about it, is that the um, the way that they paint Paris is it's dimly lit. It's kind of old. There's no Eiffel Tower shots. You know, it's not like yeah. glorified and all that. They show you like the seedy parts of Paris, what it's really like to live there. You know, like this dimly lit old world place. Yeah. And uh, I like that because it really helps with the feel of the whole movie. Absolutely. Um, the last, I think, piece of production that I sort of want to talk about is the writer, uh, the other writer, because Luc Besson was the mm -hmm. primary writer. But, Kamen? Yeah, Robert, Robert Mark Kamen. Uh, so he worked on the same stuff, yeah. uh, largely, right? Transporter franchise, Fifth Element. But he also worked on the Karate Kid franchise. Right. Which is interesting to point out. <laughs> it's fun. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's so like the polar opposite yeah. of this. Yeah. That's it such is. a weird thing to have. And, I mean, we worked on Lethal Weapon 3, so that's kind of taps. in the same... You know, that was yeah. the first movie he ever did. You know who was in Taps? Uh, I think someone that you're a fan of. You know, a guy I like to call Tom Cruise, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, so his career is interesting. I mean, who would have thought that the guy that wrote all the Karate Kid movies wrote Taken? Would you argue that the most classic movie that he ever wrote was Karate Kid 1? As opposed to? I don't know, any of the other movies we're talking about? Other than Fifth Element? Karate Kid one, in my opinion. Yeah, Karate Kid's got to be it. Yeah, I mean, like so, even yeah. like my nephews and nieces know wax on, wax off. They don't even know what the Fifth Element is. The scene. How many kids do you think signed up for karate classes because of that movie? Oh, so. I did. Right, <laughs> because of Ralph Macchio. <laughs> yeah. you just wanna... <laughs> because of Ralph Macchio and uh, Ken. Ken, what's the, what the hell's Mr. Miyagi's name? The actor. Oh, Pat Moria. Pat Moria. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like Ken, but not. Yeah. Ken <laughs> it's Jung. Like Ken. 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 <laughs> can remember this name at all. Um, <laughs> no, uh, the scene in, I know I'm just off subject here, guys, but I just thought of it, because we do, you know, fist pump moment. Yeah. yeah. The fist pump moment for me in Karate Kid is when his ankle is screwed up in the tournament, and he's like, I can't, Mr. Miyagi, and he goes, can't, <laughs> right? That's my favorite thing ever. Like, I would, oh my God. My favorite's when they're like, paint the fence, and he's like, he's like, well, this is so stupid. He's like, paint yeah. the fence, and he like blocks him. Yeah. yeah. He's like, wax on, he blocks him. He's like, oh my God, I've been learning things this whole time. What about when uh, Mr. Miyagi just snaps with those? Oh, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Do you guys think it's, it's not easy to do? <laughs> like, I think it's funny that karate in the in the early '90s was a thing that was like really cool and like yeah. a, fair, a form of combat. People like it was like very like yeah. you know it was like sexy kind of. Whereas like nowadays, karate is like kind of like a joke in a lot it of ways. Like if we did like a video of you and I doing karate, it'd be sweet. Like karate moves, <laughs> it would be like more laughable Viral. than yeah. anything yes. else. Well, yeah, they all, it's all about like judo and hapkido and like uh, like Brazilian martial yeah, arts, Brazilian, all these Brazilian jiu jitsu yeah. and yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we're way off UFC, topic. UFC, yeah, we are. We're um, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have any thoughts on your favorite form of martial arts? Or so want to see talk Andrew? about UFC. No. <laughs> yeah, well, because you're all about you're all about like, wrestling, but that's completely different. Oh, really? Is it? <laughs> yeah. You're like a pro on wrestling, right? You like know that you know it all. No, not even like oh, a no? little bit, but well, I pretend like I do. Because you do an I after like show, it. Right? Yeah, I like watching it. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I used to love uh, wrestling as a kid. Yeah, it was like... I had the belts and everything. I'm still a kid and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this movie, Critical Reception in Box Office. Let's get into that. Um, Andrew... It, yes? Uh, well, we, we argue <laughs> frequently about IMDb and like the relevance of the it's number. It's crazy because IMDb is such a tough place to get a good score but then lately these movies that we've been doing have scores beyond that that I'd ever expect. Okay, I want to ask our audience something because maybe you guys know this and I don't. I always assumed that IMDb was like those ratings were open to anyone who wanted to rate a movie. So, I believe it is if you have an account. That's how it is with almost like Metacritic, Rotten Tomatoes, everything. Mm -hmm. But Rotten Tomatoes, like you can separate like top credits and audience, right? right? So you can get a 41% off of a guy's right, that are paid to write a review. The problem with 41%, 85% is those aren't actual ratings. Right. That's the percent of Amalgamation, people. Amalgamation, right? Right. It's like out of. 100 people, 41 thought this was a good movie. It's not like I gave it a 79, yeah. you gave it a 68. Yeah, and this right? is the average. Mm -hmm. No, it's just like good or bad. So the, the numbers are very surprising because I always, like when you look at like the IMDb top 250 movies of all time. We always time, get an argument about this because yeah. I I know that list is flawed, but I also think it's very accurate. I just think like certain movies that are like um, amazing movies, mind yeah. you, great movies. Like The Dark Knight is one of my all-time favorite movies. Is not like one of the five greatest movies ever made in American history. Yeah. That's like 
a it's great the movie. It's the seventh. No. But like, or like Pulp Fiction is not like the seventh best movie. Like those are, it's like they're silly reviews. Like they're very like fanboy reviews. So let's not get into that. <sighs> but nonetheless, on IMDb, so if you guys know how this works, uh, please let me know because it would maybe solve the problem. And then Andrew and I could argue about it on the next episode. Yeah, we will argue. So the audience review on this one is 85% and the top critics is 41%. Um, another one of these movies where an action movie mm -hmm. is divided heavily. The audience loves it and the critics don't. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. I mean, I think these ratings are perfect for this movie. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a top critic, like she said, like this, and as you said, this movie's not a good movie. It's not well written. Right. It's, it, there's no good acting other than that. I mean, Liam Neeson's good in it and yeah. the speech is great. But it's not driven by like that. A good movie. I feel like yeah. I want a better word than good quality. Uh, not a. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely a good movie. Yeah, it's a good yeah. movie. It's, it's a ridiculous movie. Yeah, that's it's, what it is. It, would you call it totally ridiculous? I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Quality's good. I like that. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's not of high, high dramatic. But quality. then it almost has an eight on IMDb. I wonder which why is that beyond is beyond me. <laughs> I wonder who's coming up with those ratings. I wonder. <laughs> uh, okay, yes. Hands. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. Who are we to say? Like, well, that's, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, a seven point nine is very close to an eighty-five percent. Yeah. Um. So it's it's yeah. the fans. My scale, personally, when when rating a movie, has more to do. Like, I put five as dead average, and ten's like unattainable. Mm -hmm. So if you're four, you're like significantly below average, and yeah. if you're somewhere in the like six to seven range. That's like a decent movie. So well, you're like really harsh and critical, so. If you get to eight, like if you're like a 7.9 movie, that's yeah. like a great movie. That's like. But it is. It, it is a great movie. That's I, the thing. Is I would watch it. I have probably watched Taken at least 10 times. Yeah, yeah I've yeah. seen so. it a handful it's of true. times. Yeah. Everyone has. I've and, seen it more times than many movies. And we watched it again yeah. the other day, and it was just as enjoyable mm -hmm. as the first time. Agreed. Agreed. And there are some movies that are, you know, critically acclaimed and probably have 9.5 right. or 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, well not 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, yeah, yeah, yeah. but a lot on Rotten Tomatoes, and you've watched it once and you're like, wow, that's a great movie, but you never watch it I'm never going to watch yeah. that again, right? A great example is one of my favorite movies of all time, which I've seen more than anyone I know. Requiem for, Requiem for a Dream. <laughs> you weirdo. You, like, you watch that movie that in your movie. sleep. It's so good. It's like the saddest, <laughs> most depressing movie ever, but it's so good, but people watch it once, and they're like, I never need to see that again. Hey, Drew, what are you doing? I'm great, mood, man. There's just uh, drinking, a, <laughs> just drinking um, a cocktail watching uh, Requiem for a Dream. You want to come hang out? No, I'm good, man. I'm, no, uh, I don't want to come over. over. <laughs> why do you always invite me over when you're watching that? I don't know why this just popped in my head, but American History X. Like, I love yep. that movie. <laughs> another yeah, one that's another one of my favorites. Yeah, time. it's an incredible Boom. movie, but I don't know that I've seen, I've seen it twice. We'll take, uh, it. We'll take over the show. I'm in the same <laughs> boat. I'm in the same boat. Um, I've seen that movie at least a dozen times. I know, oh, okay. I know. Yeah. Well, all right, all right. Well, let's get back. Let's move it along. I've seen the Lego movie four times, so. Yeah, Lego movie is really good. It's really, really good. That's uh, awesome. No, that's good. Yeah. So yeah, so Neeson actually had said originally that he expected this movie to be straight to video and a little side road for his career, mm -hmm. um, which I think is interesting. He, in terms of reviewing the movie and the reviews that it got, as we saw, this was like, this wasn't just like a, this wasn't like, oh, he can do this too. This is all he's done since he did Taken. Yeah. yeah. He's in seven movies. Has he done anything other? Like, do we know? Has he done anything I mean, other than this? Does he have one credit other than like those seven action movies we uh, named? A million ways to die in the West. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, which was like a comedy, which yeah. was that's okay. Ted Two, he's in, I think. Yeah, he has, a, yeah, has the cameo. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't really count. And then he Dark Knight Rises, but he's not really in it. In it, he yeah, Ducard, he shows up. Ducard, great movie. I just love uh, some of his interviews that he did to promote Taken, and then to then promote Taken 2 where he's so calm and collected and he's just such a cool dude but he'll like he went on Good Morning America to pr promote Taken 2 and he just said ass in front of like the entire like yeah, yeah, yeah. viewing audience and <laughs> yeah like he's unabashedly himself yeah. yeah he's awesome oh he also did third person we talked about that just a second ago that was the that was the um, the what the hell's his name the director of, of Crash Haggis. Uh, Paul, Paul Haggis, Haggis movie yeah. with like Maria Bello and me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I the didn't one that I see that yeah, one, yeah. yeah, it was all right. It was, yeah, he's good in it. Um, that's that's definitely more like old school Liam Neeson, and he'd been mm -hmm. in a lot of this. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, reviewed pretty favorably. I, what, what some of the reviews we got here. It's fun for about 15 minutes seeing Neeson do James Bond as Daddy Dangerous, but mm -hmm. the surprise wears off quickly. That's Pete Travers from Rolling Stone. Or uh, he's Kelly Vance. He's pretty critical. He's pretty. He's pretty hard to win over. I feel. Travers. Yeah. I didn't copy down the uh, the Ebert review. The Ebert one was also pretty brutal. Yeah, but uh, Kelly Vance of the East Bay Express said Neeson stars in the sort of part Harrison Ford would have gotten ten or fifteen years ago. I think that's also pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, but we'll get to that when we get to recast because I have I have my thoughts on that. Um, I want to talk about the box office on this movie because this is sort of one of the more perplexing parts of it. Is that? Oh yeah. When I, when we were doing the research on this, we were both kind of shocked. 
Yeah, so the first thing you notice here is that release date January 30th, 09. So there was a lot of uh, press just this last year for the fact that American Sniper made so much money in January. Mm -hmm. January is usually not when you release a movie that you expect to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Right, it's, it's that's, a little late. It's more like, that's kind of like award season, and even then, you're probably more like February if you really mm -hmm. want the movie to just be like hot. Right. Um, but... Uh, oh, I like this. Yeah, oh yeah, it's right behind us here. So yeah, so Taken, made, it was made for $25 million, which is like pretty standard budget for like a straight to video style action mm -hmm. movie. Um, but it made 145 domestic, another 81.8 .8 international for a total of $226 million. This movie made $226 million. Yeah, it almost 10 times its budget. Like, can Nine. you imagine the, like the, the, the staff meeting when Luke Besson's like, yeah, we're going to make this Taken movie. Um, oh, Ju Jeff Bridges was originally supposed to be right. yeah. Liam Neeson. Stop it. Yeah, yeah. Would have been epic. He, yeah. <laughs> he had already been like, he had already signed on. And then, Tony. <laughs> would have been hilarious. Yeah. And that's actually a great example of exactly what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, Bridges, that's, that's true. That's the other guy that yeah. would have been able to do it in 08. Because same sort of thing. He'd always been respected, Oscar worthy, and then just like gets this movie like for whatever and... weird reason. Yeah, okay. yeah. And Iron Man, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, because was Crazy Heart like right around the same time? It was like a little bit before that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's pretty interesting. So this movie, yeah, it made two twenty six, opened at uh, twenty four million dollars against New in Town and The Uninvited. I don't remember either of those movies. Uh, the Uninvited was like a mediocre horror movie. Okay, yep, January. I'm a, yeah, I'm a big horror movie guy, so. It uh, was the number one movie of the weekend, beating out Paul Blart Mall Cop by $11 million. Wait, what? And Paul Blart was in its third week, <laughs> its which third still week. made $11 million. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah, so you love Paul Blart Mall Cop? No, I'm <laughs> <just> <laughs> Number two's coming out. What are you guys doing this Friday? <laughs> <laughs> so the most successful, sec uh, most successful taken film domestically, but the least successful of the series in total gross. And worldwide, which Crazy. is mind-blowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have, like, uh, Taken 3 made three... Oh no, Taken 2 was the most successful. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. wrong. So 376, 325, and 226. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, and the budgets for these were only like 45 and 48 or something like that. Like, it's not crazy. Like, you could be a kid in high school, like Luke Besson's kid, mm -hmm. and they're like, what'd your dad do? And it's like, oh, he came up with the Taken franchise. Like, if your dad came up with the Taken oh, franchise, that'd be, like, you wouldn't even have to be Luke. You wouldn't have to be, you just, like... You'd probably get Taken because your family's so rich. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Held for ransom. Exactly. I can tell you I don't have any money. I don't... <laughs> I can tell you I don't have money. Um, yeah, so I, th I thought that was pretty interesting. I mean, we don't really need to harp on the uh, the numbers too much more. Yeah, I was, I was shocked at that, though. I was very blown away to see that number two and three were more successful than the first one. Yeah. And especially internationally I would have thought it would be more so domestic mm -hmm. there's like this weird thing right we and we saw this with Denzel so this is this has been happening as we've been doing the research recently for a lot of these action movies the international market for this type of movie is much stronger than it is domestically yeah because you see a lot of the style of movie or even just even just like the the credit that's on the box the way that it's written the way that like the shadowy figure with a gun or something mm -hmm. For whatever weird reason, like international markets are just about it. So, like when we looked at, uh, for instance, Denzel Washington's highest-grossing movies, uh, Denzel Washington's highest-grossing movies, like what was that? Safe House with Ryan Reynolds yeah, was one of his highest-grossing really? movies ever. I've never seen The Equalizer was yeah. one of his highest-grossing movies. What's his airplane one? Uh, Flight. 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 That yeah. no, that did, no, oh, no, really? Because well. that's like that's like a dramatic Oscar movie. Yeah. It's like it's like Safe the, House was number two. Safe House was his second highest-grossing movie ever. Like that's just the way it is. So if you look at like the, the if like you, internationally, he's not successful. No. So if you throw up the if you throw up the uh, the Liam Neeson worldwide yeah. box office numbers, yeah. Dark Knight Rises makes sense, right? Star Wars Episode One, Chronicles of Narnia, Clash of the Titans, Lego Movie. I mean, not, nothing that he's ever done that was like. I mean, this is where we talk about this guy that can be put in any situation, any role. Yeah. You look at the list. Wrath of the Titans, Love Actually, I love that movie. Batman yeah. Begins. Classic. Like, all the I Taken movies. I love that movies. you love that movie. Oh, I absolutely Just love that movie. Everybody loves Love Actually. I feel it in my fingers. <laughs> I feel it in my toes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my it's the, gosh. It's the best. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you look at his career, and it's just like, it's massive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you got a billion dollar movie in there. You got two that are over three quarters of a million or a billion. Yeah. It's just, his career has been awesome. On your deathbed, Liam, what's the greatest thing you ever did with your life? I was in a movie that made a billion dollars once. <laughs> I was a lion. I was Aslan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an iconic role. Oh, absolutely. Very, very much so. Yeah. So, guys, we normally do ultimate action scene, but because this movie doesn't really feel like it has an ultimate action scene, mm -hmm. um, 
I think we all kind of agreed that the epic monologue abduction scene, yep. that sort of is the ultimate action scene. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to kind of briefly talk about this scene as the, as it plays here in the background. Wait, you don't think that him <coughs> driving and being chased by another car that goes into a, what was it, a bulldozer? Yeah, yeah. Slices yeah, it's, off the top of it? That's not the ultimate? It's interesting. No, it is. That is a very good scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's interesting because Ben and I were talking about, like, what's the best car chase that you've seen in the last, that, that you can remember, like the best car chase scene, and we both were like the Born Identity car it's like chase. Like a classic scene. one. Yeah, like you watched that in theaters, and you were like, "Holy crap! Did that re did that really just happen?" And even the one in two and three, there's there's a couple yeah, yeah. more that are all great. One, I really like the Italian job. Oh, car that's phenomenal! Too. It's got a really good yeah. car chase, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's this is another thing where this movie is kind of like that generic level. Like the car chase scene isn't great. No, it's not bad. It's yeah, very yeah. forgettable. Yeah. So this scene, I mean, really, I, there's. I guess there's not that much to say about it other than the speech. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if you, as we said, if you try to think about this movie and, and what are you going to remember it for and how are you going to relate this movie to somebody 10 years from now mm -hmm. if, if you haven't seen it since or something, it's just going to be talking about this scene. This right. scene and her getting pulled out from under the bed. I feel right. like that's they something left. that you just, it's ingrained in everyone's memory as well. So in the sense of like pure dramatic action, um, I would I would definitely argue this is a great scene. Like it's... It's yeah. a great scene for yeah exactly for the monologue and for her getting pulled. I would even say it starts a little before this. It's when she's on the phone and she sees them taking because yeah. it's she's like, like she's like coming clean. She's a sweet girl. She's like dad, I have something to tell you. They're here. <laughs> I didn't go see you too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Her cousins are in Spain. Yeah. Yeah. And she and you know he's like he's like stay focused, stay focused, baby. Like what whatever he says. Like he's th th I, like my favorite is like, the next part is very important. Yeah. Exactly. Like, like, they're going to take you. Yeah. It's like, oh Jesus, really? Yeah. That's your that's your answer as a dad. Because he's a stone cold badass, yeah, and he, he has knows. To, he, he has to lay it all on the table, happen. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I definitely think, like, yeah. it, it was impossible for Taken Two and Three to have this any, moment. Well, it's just if you take out this the memorable quality of this moment, this movie becomes exactly what it looked like it was going to be, which mm -hmm. was like just another action movie. I mean, it should be noted that Liam Neeson's a phenomenal actor. He is incredible. So I mean, that's that's what we talk about in all these movies. That I'm going to always talk about the two. Yeah. Air Force One and The Rock. Yeah. You have these guys that give <laughs> such Oscar-worthy performances at, as bad guys. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be that way. Um, Bill Pullman and Independence Day. That's great. That yeah. bring this movie to another level. Yeah. And he does. It's just, it's by it's by sheer force of will. It's his, his performance is that good. So two and three, what do you, you can't mimic it. So like right. you end up with you know, I, I don't. Do you think we'll ever do Taken two or three on this show? Maybe. Maybe. You have a lot of other movies. Yeah, there's exactly. a lot of movies to get through. She, she makes a very valid. Point. She makes a valid point. <laughs> um, so, in honor of the phenomenal speech that he gives, I'm going to move us straight into favorite line. Yep. Um, because it would be very easy for us to all choose this monologue as the favorite line. Um, I thought about it. I chose a different favorite line. I know my favorite line too. All right, let's, she's excited. Yeah, she's let's excited. Let's Kathy. Um, when Kim says, Dad, you don't have to worry. And he says, uh, yep. that's like telling water not to be wet, sweetie. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. Such a dad line. It's like it's the ultimate line. <laughs> <laughs> dad jokes. Uh, mine is, uh, I once had a wife. My great love. Oh, wait, that's Batman That's Begins. Batman Begins, <laughs> man. <laughs> Look, I love that line. I was going to bring it in somehow. Uh <laughs> Okay, so other than the one I said earlier about lack of payment on the bill. That's a really that's, good line. That's probably yeah. my favorite. Uh, there's also the, uh, now's not the time for dick measuring, Stuart. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> one. It's great. <laughs> and then the other one is, look, Jean-Claude, I'll burn the Eiffel Tower to the ground if I have to. Yeah. Okay, so so you guys, like, you look very well in the fine lines. The line that I went with is, it's actually not him, and it's like broken up. Uh -huh. But it's when it's when he finds the the like the rich like, Jergoff guy who's oh, got yeah, the, exactly who's running the say. club or whatever, yeah. and he's chasing him into the elevator with the gun, and he and he sh so he starts to talk, and the first thing the guy says, he says, "You have like what was he saying? You have no idea," and he just shoots him. Yeah, because it's like you know in any of these movies, the villains always like you have no idea who you're dealing with. It doesn't even let him finish. Yeah, he the doesn't state. care. He already mm -hmm. knows who he's dealing with. The beauty of it is though, because it's an action movie, you know exactly what he's gonna yeah, say. It's perfect, and that's what they're playing on. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he's like, "Wait, we can," t and he shoots him again, like. I like that whole sequence so yeah. much. You have to understand. It was all just not business. Business. Not business. It's not personal. It's not personal. It's personal to me. Yeah. And he shoots him like six times. Bang, it's bang. great. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> do, 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 do. That's like, I just like that so much because it's like one of those, like, you know, it's like the, it's the people who understand the genre kind of winking at us. Yeah, yeah like absolutely. We can kind of next level you on this right. And then writing. he goes up in the elevator to the gala. Oh, I love it. You're just dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so good. Those are the, that's the thing about this movie is it has some of the best payoffs. Yeah, like the the torture scene when he just leaves him there. This when he kills this guy immediately doesn't even let him finish his sentence. Yeah, when he caps the uh, the 
what's, what's he called? The harem or whatever he is. The prince oh, the on the ship. The sheik. Yeah. Right. He just shoots him in the head. Just another, He's like, wait, we can talk. Boom. Just another brutal, just another yeah. brutal stereotype. So we, uh, we're we going to move into sort of the closing statements here, guys. Um, once again, if you want to join in on the discussion for favorite line or recast, uh, that is one of our favorite things to have you guys do. So please comment and let us know who you would recast. Um, hero villain ranking all time. Do we think... Obviously, there's no villain. That I ranks. could put Liam in the top top fifty. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna Maybe have to start. We're gonna have to like put a board up pretty soon that actually has where yeah. we rank everyone. So I then think... you have to bump people off the board too. Yeah, yeah, yeah move yeah. them up yeah. and down. Yeah, that will happen soon, guys. We that'll are gonna, be, we are working on that'll that. That'll be a thing that we're gonna do. Um, I I mean I wouldn't. I'm like Brian Mill. I mean, maybe, maybe <laughs> he's 50. the ultimate overbearing dad. Right. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's. I guess he's Old iconic. It, yeah. it, like, I feels like it hasn't been long enough in memory to like really. I mean, what, it's been six years since this came out? Or, I mean, yeah. it's been seven or whatever, and they've already made three? <laughs> maybe. Maybe top 50. I I probably don't even put them top 50. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's get into recast. Yeah, um, we're running short on time, so this is our this is our favorite part. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we're not, yeah. Let's, we'll, we'll wrap it up. We're going to hit the recast real fast. So what is, I'm going to let you guys uh, start us off here. After you. After me? Okay. Uh, let's start with uh, let's start with Famke. Famke Janssen. Yes. Okay. Uh, Annette Benning. Mid, oh, this is for the record, guys. We're recasting as if this movie were made in 1995. Yes. So it's like several years before you saw American her in American Beauty, Beauty. Right. You know, she, you know that she can be this evil, yeah, bitch of a mom. And, it's good. And she's she's horrible. She throws Brian under the bus over and over and over in this movie. Under the bus. Under the bus. I said, I said yeah. over and under. <laughs> uh, yes. So Annette Benning. Um, mine was kind of a two-parter, so it has to be both characters. Okay. Uh, but it was. <laughs> this is really bad. Bruce Willis and Demi Moore, and then that's what they would find. Oh, they were together? Yeah, but yeah. no, I, I actually really do like Bruce Willis for the role of yeah. Liam Neeson. Um, Mid 90s, yeah, it's yeah. solid. That's, I can that's, see both of them doing that. That's Die Hard Part 3. I mean, that's like he's at the great age. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, Demi Moore, that's G.I. Jane, Demi Moore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I Love like it. But then movie. I also thought Harrison Ford would be great. He's and like, they, yeah. they he's mentioned the, that. Too. He's the go to. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, so uh, I went with Sharon Stone. That's good. Okay. For uh, for for Famke. Yeah. Uh, like that's a casino era, but I was thinking like when she looks crazy and drugged out at the end, and she looks older, mm -hmm. like you go with like that, like kind of like mm -hmm. beautiful but ugly Sharon Stone. I think you could like get away yeah. with that. Yeah. I also thought uh, Julianne Moore would be good for it. Um, yeah. But that's yeah. I mean it's kind of the same thing as Famke Jansen, like they yeah, yeah yeah parallel each other a little bit. Um. All right. So I'll, I did Mel. Mel Gibson? Mel Gibson. It's strong? It's strong. I feel like that's the thing with these these guys that are such massive, like Bruce Willis, Harrison Ford, Mel Gibson yeah. in the 90s, is, is it almost feels like a cop-out. Mm -hmm. But if this movie came out in the 90s, I saw Ransom. Yeah. I saw Payback. If sure. this was I want to see Mel Gibson. 90s straight to uh, video, Sequel? I would say Mr. T. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's, yeah. that's good. I'd go Steven Seagal. Yeah, yeah. So, because, okay, so I, I'll make this quick. My, my thought was basically that all the guys we're talking about, Mel Gibson, Bruce Willis, like, you run over all the movie stars, you're like, when this movie was made with, with Neeson, though, that wasn't, like, the role he was. Right. So you have to think about, like, who was a guy that in that year, that's why I said, like, it almost would be more hilarious if it was like Richard Gere right. or like yeah. Dennis Quaid. I feel like that's I like Dennis Quaid. Okay. Enough. I think that'd be good. But as they say, Dennis Quaid is a poor man's Kevin Costner, which is kind of exactly what you'd want for this movie. Right. You know, he, like he's stoic. But uh, ultimately, what I what I went with was uh, I may have just actually just gone with Harrison Ford in the end. But I, I think I like Quaid more. Really? I think Quaid's better. What if you just yeah. kept Liam Neeson because he would yeah, still he be the right age-ish. So the naggy Grace, uh, I went with Dominique Swain, the daughter from Face Off. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think it's solid. I know okay. what you're talking about. Yeah. I went with Reese Witherspoon. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like, it's like election. It's like a few years yeah. before election. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for the daughter, I didn't. Yeah, even it's think. fair. Yeah. Yeah. Recasting just, children is difficult. Yeah, it's always hard. <laughs> even though she's like 23. Like, I don't even know what, who would be 17 at that. I was a reach on Dominic Swain. I almost went with uh, Natalie Portman, but she's like 14 or 15. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Too young. Or something. yeah, yeah exactly. But too a little young. too young. Um, we. <laughs> We are going to run straight through yeah, Cage versus Cruise as much as I would like to do Tom Cruise. I'd or, like to do God. either of the, the whole speech in their voice. Uh, why didn't we think about that? God. We're so bad at our jobs. I don't know who you are. But. <laughs> <laughs> got a very particular set of skills. A very particular set of skills. Um, all right. Anyway, so let's uh, talk categories. There are three action movie categories, guys. There is totally legitimate. That is going to be like The Fugitive or Die Hard, a movie that is... Uh, very sound movie outside of the action genre. There is totally ridiculous. That is fall off a cliff of absurdity. We're talking now, most recently, Independence Day, and also Face Off, Face Off, Con, Con Air, Air. Yeah. And then there's like the middle category, which is legitimately ridiculous. Which is that's kind of like the hybrid category, if you will. And we like to put you know Point Break or The Rock in that category. So which of those three categories does this movie fit into? What do you guys think? 
legitimately ridiculous. Middle category? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Same. Ridiculous, legitimate. A ridiculous, legitimate. Wait, yeah. Did I screw it up? I don't know. One of us Both. did. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. I go the totally, middle category. I go totally ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. Okay. Totally ridiculous. I understand that. I mean, yeah. he takes down the whole entire thing by himself. Yeah. He doesn't even ask any of his covert ops buddies to help mm -hmm. him. It's awesome. And then he's still able to leave the country with his daughter. No questions oh, yeah, asked. No problem. He got his visa stamped. He just killed like seven people. He got a standard action. He got a standard action movie gunshot, like gunshot wound, like. That's like right. a standard. We, we don't ever talk about that. Yeah, you got to get hit once. Yeah, you take one bullet like in the arm or the leg, yeah. but you can just like power through it. You're fine. You're you so usually angry. don't even flinch. Yeah. Yeah, your testosterone. It's just a flesh wound. Sad. Adrenaline. <laughs> All right, so that wraps it up for us, guys, for Action Movie Anatomy, the Taken episode. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I want to thank my lovely co-hosts one more time. Andrew Guy, where can the people find you? Uh, at Andrew Guy on Twitter. And thank you so much, Kathy. Thanks for having me. This is so much fun. Yeah, you're great. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Catherine Kelly and on Instagram at Kathy Kelly. Yeah, and you guys can find me at uh, Ben Bateman Media on Twitter or Instagram. We'll see you next week. Bye. Doom. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. Views expressed herein are those of the hosts only, and not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.